ever so much, Anne, for that kind introduction and for hosting um, Friends of Bartonshire Barton Meadows here today to do an introduction to our campaign, which has been running for just less than a year. So this evening, I think we've got sort of five of us, six of us are going to speak relatively briefly, um, and then we'd love to have any contributions, any questions at the end, and we'll try to answer anything that you that you raise. So Anna Gundry is going to speak first, then Jeremy Mill, then Bill Laws, then James Hitch Hitchcock, then I'll give a brief campaign update and Chloe will finish off for us. So first of all, I would like to introduce Anna Gundry, who is a local resident and an ecology consultant and has been intimately involved with this project from the very, very early nascent days of walking through the meadows together going, oh, wow, what could this be? Hello, everybody. Um, nice to see so many familiar faces. Um, those who don't make, um, know me, I'll just give a brief introduction to myself and then um, and I'd like to kick off a session by just talking about um, what uh, wonderful habitat floodplain meadows are and what they can deliver. So I've lived close to Bartonshire Meadows for 14 years and regularly walk around them with my children and it's particularly spectacular today. We're incredibly lucky in Hereford to have 100 acres of countryside right in the heart of the city, as was particularly apparent during the first lockdown when they provided safe recreational space for a variety of different user groups. I'm currently a freelance consultant ecologist, but my background's in the public sector. Started my ecological career about 25 years ago at ADAS in Reedsdale, and I've worked at, for Natural England as a conservation officer, first in Kent and then in Oxfordshire. And it was in Oxfordshire I first came across floodplain, me floodplain meadows with some, some amazing examples along the Thames. Our vision is to support the transition of Bartonshire Meadows to sustainable wildlife friendly management. The current arable regime has left the meadows with negligible semi-natural habitat and very limited biodiversity value. The fields therefore present a blank canvas on which new habitats can be developed and environmental and social gain optimised. The central city location means that they're regularly used by a variety of groups, so any new management of the meadows needs to take into account the varying needs of the local community, whilst delivering ecosystem services and providing a diverse and rich environment in which wildlife can thrive. A mosaic of habitats, including willow car, water bodies and traditional orchards, as well as amenity areas could be developed, but the core land use most appropriate to the situation and history of the meadows, and with the greatest potential to deliver environmental gain, is floodplain meadow. I'd like to talk about what a floodplain meadow actually is, and what makes it special, and why the restoration and creation of this habitat is so appropriate to Barnsham Meadows. So habitats in Britain are classified according to the National Vegetation Classification, or NVC. This was commissioned in 1975 by the Nature Conservancy Council to provide a comprehensive and systematic catalogue of the plant communities of Britain. It is the industry standard classification and provides a common language for ecologists to identify and describe natural and semi-natural habitats. It works by grouping vegetation into types on the basis of the presence and relative abundance of plant species. The resulting plant communities can usually be correlated with other factors, particularly geology, hydrology, soils and management. One of the key factors that affects the species assemblage is the underlying soil acidity. On this basis, MVC classification defines grassland according to three broad groups, acid, calcareous and neutral. Distinctive plant communities can be distinguished within these groups, which have developed depending on other environmental and human influences. The majority of agricultural land within the British lowlands is neutral grassland. This includes wildflower rich hay meadows, agriculturally improved pastures, wet brushy grass, grasslands and also floodplain meadows. Floodplain meadow grassland is characteristic of areas where traditional hay management has been carried out on seasonally flooded land with alluvial soils. Typically the grassland would be shut up for hay in spring and mown in July. The aftermath is then grazed by cattle with stock being turned out at the beginning of August. Under this system meadows receive no fertiliser apart from the manure of grazing animals but of greater importance of the winter flooding with its input of nutrients and deposition of silt and decaying organic matter. Deep alluvial profiles accumulate under the meadows with repeated deposition of silt. Winter flooding often leads the meadows waterlogged for a time, but the underlying free draining gravel profile allows the water to drain, allowing the meadows to dry out. It's thought that typical floodplain meadows are around a thousand years old. These floodplain meadows have a very localised distribution, with the richer examples being sparsely scattered in the Midlands and parts of southern Britain. So we're lucky in Hereford to have two good examples of floodplain meadows very close to home, as I'm sure you're all aware. Lug Meadow and Hampton Meadow are both traditionally managed by the Wildlife Trust. And further afield near Erdersley, 
and also managed by the Wildlife Trust is the Sturts. These tree sites are examples of the MVC community most typical of traditionally managed floodplain meadows, which is known as MG4 Alipicurus pretensis sanguisorbia officinalis grassland, or Burnet Meadow for short. Botanically, this type of vegetation is one of the most species-rich grassland communities found in the UK. The Floodplain Meadows Partnership has recorded quadrats with up to 43 species per metre squared, making this one of the richest neutral grassland habitats in the UK. So what does a floodplain meadow look like? A traditionally managed grassland is rich in plant species and the sward can be quite tall and vigorous, with larger broadleaf species such as meadow sweet much in evidence. The composition can vary, but characteristic species are great burnet, common sorrel, meadow vetchling, meadow foxtail and meadow buttercup. There are two species of particular note that occasionally occur on floodplain meadows. These are the nationally scarce snake's head fertility and narrow leaved water dropwort, both of which occur on lug meadows and the latter is also present on Hampton Meadow. If you look at the next slide, there's some examples of some of the um, wildlife that can be found on the meadows. The species rich sward of a typical floodplain meadow and the fact that it's left unmown for the majority of the growing season means that they offer a significant seasonal resource of pollen and nectar for a large number of invertebrate species. Bumblebees, sawflies and hoverflies can be abundant. It follows that invertebrate predator species can also be abundant, including ground beetles and spiders. Higher up the food chain, the grass, a grassland rich in invertebrates will benefit insectivores such as bats. The River, Vi the y the River Wye is an important navigational route and foraging resource for bats and the development of species-rich grassland along with associated habitats such as hedgerows and trees that expand the foraging range of this protected group of species. Floodplain meadows can also provide a rich habitat for a range of birds during the year. During the spring and summer, larger sites in particular can be important for breeding waders such as lapwing and curlew, providing nesting habitat and soft feeding grounds. Whilst it's perhaps optimistic to expect nesting waders at Bartonshire Meadows given its urban location, it may be possible to manage it so as to provide undisturbed areas during the breeding season to encourage ground nesting skylarks, for example. At other times of year, especially during and after periodic flooding, they can provide winter feeding grounds for a wide range of wildflower and fowl and waders. Floodplain meadows also provide year-round foraging for small passerines that rely on seeds and invertebrates and feeding and roosting habitat for wintering species such as starling, redwing and fieldfare. A habitat rich in invertebrates, particularly if it forms part of a diverse assemblage of habitats that are retained after the hay cut, such as hedgerows or stands of unknown vegetation, can support small mammals such as field vole, and common shrew and more common reptile species. So whilst bi the biodiversity value of traditionally managed floodplain meadow meadows would be ready readily apparent if you were to walk through in the summer months, the habitat delivers several other so-called ecosystem services which would have a direct benefit to Hereford and the River Wye as well as contributing to the fight against climate change. So if we change to the next slide. Floodplain meadows can help to reduce flood peaks in towns and cities located downstream by absorbing and storing water that would otherwise flood low-lying areas. Natural floodplains, and in particular floodplain meadows, could play a vital role in reducing the sort of flooding that has repeatedly overwhelmed towns and villages across Britain over the past decade. Meadows have the capacity to sort, store vast quantities of flood water and release it slowly over time, lowering the peak water level. In contrast, modern flood defences use embankments to constrain flood water to a narrow channel. This simply pushes the problem downstream until flood waters reach levels that can overwhelm defences, sometimes with catastrophic results. The reason why meadows are so effective at soaking up sudden influxes of water is because traditional meadow systems produce good open structured soil that increases their capacity to absorb and store water. By comparison, a regularly ploughed arable field leaves the soils more compact, reducing their ability to absorb water. Meadows represent an agricultural system that actually works in harmony with the dynamic river system. As well as absorbing flood water, they collect and put to good use the sediment that would otherwise be deposited downstream, causing blockages and smothering valuable riverbed habitats. Phosphorus and nitrogen are essential for plant growth, but an overabundance in the watercourse can cause adverse effects on health and ecology. The increasing use of fertilisers in agriculture over the past 70 years has resulted in increased levels of both nitrogen and phosphorus in watercourses and concerns over water quality. And it's been widely publicised that parts of the river wire are breaching the required phosphate limits. Nitrate is readily lost from the soil through leaching and phosphorus is lost through soil erosion. Floodplain meadows may be able to improve the river water quality through facilitating the deposition of sediment bound phosphorus and the removal of nitrogen, 
as small doses of phosphorus and nitrogen can be absorbed by floodplain meadows and turned into a crop. In this way, excess NMP can remo be removed from the catchment and forage produced for animals without the need for artificial fertilizers. This is a very sustainable agricultural system and an excellent method for reducing unwanted nutrients and fine sediment in rivers, ultimately resulting in improvements in downstream water quality. A sustainably managed floodplain meadow can also play a role in combating climate change. Recent estimates of carbon storage in UK soils vary depending on the habitat type and land use. It is estimated that grazed grasslands can sequester 0.6 tonnes per hectare per year, whilst the conversion of permanent grassland to arable will release about between 1 and 1.7 tonnes per hectare per year. Alluvial soils such as those supporting floodplain meadows are particularly important in carbon sequestration because they grow deeper with each flood event, providing new soil to fill with carbon. In this way they can securely hold large amounts of carbon. It is claimed that in this respect they are probably only second to peat in the UK. So in summary, if we could just change to the last slide, I'd like to end by giving a plug for the Flood, Me flood Meadows Partnership who have produced a fantastic handbook on flood meadow management. The Flood Meadow Management Handbook summarises very nicely the benefits of restoring and creating floodplain meadows as follows. They are a productive system adapted to a floodplain environment, needing minimal inputs, remaining productive even during droughts. They can form part of a viable commercial enterprise, producing good quality, sustainably produced hay and nutritionally valuable forage for livestock grazing in late summer and early autumn. They support a range of wildlife that has now almost vanished from the Britain, including pollinating insects and rare species. They represent an important element of our rural history and are part of our cultural heritage that we should protect. They are an integral part of cherished rural landscapes as painted by Turner and Constable and celebrated, celebrated by poets and writers. They provide storage of carbon, sediments, nutrients and floodwaters. A change from species poor pasture or arable to species rich meadow will result in a net reduction of nutrients in the catchment through hay cropping and a reduction of artificial inputs. And they provide an important resource of education and research personal enjoyment, rest, relaxation, mental and physical health and well-being. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna, for that detailed uh, explanation of why this is such a great project and so important. As you can see, we have benefited immensely from Anna's detailed knowledge of ecology. Um, and I've asked Anna if we can write up the longer version of her talk as a, a document that we can store on our website. So if people are kind of interested in going back and getting more de detail, then that resource will be available for you. Thank you, Anna. OK, our next speaker is Jeremy Milne, who is the uh, Central Ward Councillor. So, Jeremy, are you... Able yes. To meet yourself? Hi, thank you. Uh, hi. hi. Th thank you, Ruth. So, um, uh, Ruth has asked me to give uh, a, a perspective from Herefordshire Council. Um, I, I would say that Herefordshire Council as an organisation doesn't have a perspective necessarily on, on Bartonshire Meadows. And so uh, uh, what, I'm about, what I'm about to say really is, 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 is this one particular councillor's perspective um, as shaped by the overall agenda that uh, our administration is pursuing. And um, uh, you probably gathered uh, that um, we are doing things slight, slightly differently since we were elected in May 2019 to, to the previous administration, um, radically differently in some respects. Um, the principal respect, I think, uh, that, uh, that um, applies to what we're, we're trying to achieve for Bartonshire Meadows is our, um, our recognition of social value. So we've adopted what, what is known as the, the, the Preston model of procurement, local procurement, of ensuring that whatever we do uh, isn't simply measured against purely economic goals, that, uh, that social and environmental ones are just as important. And that's, those principles are embedded in, the, in our, our new county plan and the, um, and the actions that, that, that follow from that. I'm also going to talk a bit about um, the Stronger Towns Fund. Now, the Stronger Towns Fund isn't actually an organ of Herefordshire Council, although uh, Herefordshire Council has to be the accountable body for the funding. So it has an advisory role as well as a, as a sort of manages the budget ultimately role. Um, and you probably gather that um, 
in early November when uh, outline bids were being invited for the Stronger Towns Fund, we as a, as a friends group uh, submitted such a bid and we um, had to uh, think about uh, six criteria by which those bids would be measured. So when the board sat down and looked at the various bids, and there were about 40 of them, I think, uh, it would evaluate them against these criteria. And they are, they are, they are criteria that uh, we, we, we've, we've borrowed from elsewhere, principally from um, um, a social value project uh, at Nelsea, the 65 High Street project, and we heard a bit about that. Those of us who were on the, on the left bank talk uh, last night heard a little bit about that from from Ian Morrill, the, the town, uh, not from Ian Morrill, from Dr. Malcolm Wiglow, I think from, um, from Nelsea. And um, the, 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 those criteria has, have to um, all uh, show that uh, the projects have uh, stakeholder support, which clearly we have, and that's what one, one, one great benefit of having a friends group is to generate that, that visibility and that, uh, that broad support. Um, it's, it, it, the projects have to demonstrate that they are viable and affordable and achievable, obviously, and, and they have to achieve, d demonstrate this, this social value. Now, the, the criteria that those, those, those three were being measured against were um, uh, ensuring that projects contribute towards a Hereford that is zero carbon and nature rich. You know that we've declared a, a climate emergency, um, a climate and ecological emergency, and we were on a path to climate zero by 2030. That's a, that's a, a council commitment. Uh, it, uh, projects need to contribute towards levelling up. Now, this is very much a sort of conservative party, party uh, uh, language, which we're sort of reflecting back at them, really, isn't it? That um, um, ensuring that opportunities for disadvantaged groups for are, are, are provided in, in the projects just as, as surely as they are for for, um, uh, for, 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 for everybody else uh, to um, ensure that projects thirdly are promote innovation, creativity and new technologies um, and uh, uh, the Bartonshire Meadows uh, in my opinion I think uh, it offers huge opportunities for all those three for innovation creativity and, and new technologies uh, done right um, improves physical and digital connectivity well certainly certainly it's a great meeting place isn't it and we've all all walked those those meadows not at the moment obviously it's about six foot under but we've all walked those meadows and pumped into friends there that they promote it promotes learning and skills that's a key criteria uh, and that it builds on heritage and attracts visitors and uh, investors. So those are the those are the were the six criteria by which the stronger towns bids were measured. Now, um, Herefordshire Council, uh, the, the, sorry, the, the stronger towns fund has sadly, unfortunately, not shortlisted our bid. But that was simply because, well, I, in my opinion, I believe it was because we couldn't d demonstrate that as yet. Uh, and no doubt Ruth will come on to this later in terms of our negotiations with the church commissioners uh, that, um, that, 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 that that we could deliver. Um, there, there, there is nothing on the table. We haven't got an offer on the table to take on the meadows and go forwards with it for a funding bid. We just, we just can't do it at the moment. Um, sadly, uh, the timing isn't right. Maybe if the Stronger Towns Fund had come a few months further down the, down the road, we, we might well have got further with our negotiations with the Church Commissioners to enable that to happen. But, and so, um, alas, I haven't been able to take it to uh, colleagues let, in, in, in Council, let alone in Cabinet, uh, with any kind of formal proposal. Um, I have spoken informally to the leader, and the leader is, in, is, is very supportive. So they are extremely well aware of us, uh, they would, would I am sure, be hugely supportive. Um, all the members of the cabinet would be. I mean, I think particularly Ellie Chance, um, Councillor Councillor Chance is the cabinet member for um, uh, for, for for skills and, and climate and environment. Uh, also, cabinet member uh, Gemma Davis, 
for whose uh, procurement um, uh, a member and um, she, she, she has a very lively understanding of social value. Um, so I, I've, I'm absolutely confident that if, if hopefully we get into a position where we can really build up a jolly good, good, good bid for the, for the Meadows project, that we will get support from the council on it. But I can't honestly say any more than that. And I'm going to have to dash at this point. I said I'd do three minutes and I think I've done slightly more than that. And I've got another meeting at half past. So if you'll forgive me, I've perhaps got one, one, one minute to take a question if anybody's got any particular questions, but. Thank you so much, Jeremy. That was really informative, really helpful. Um, we're not going to take questions now, Jeremy, because we're going to save them for the end. And Jeremy had indicated that if we have questions for you, we can email them to you. So we will save the chat from this event and we will make sure stuff gets forwarded to Jeremy. And if you would like to receive a response, then you'll need to make sure I have your email address. If you don't want to put it in the chat, then you can send it to me directly and the email address is on the Friends of Bartonshire Meadows website. So thank you very much for your comments there, Jeremy. And Jeremy has been instrumental in helping us. Um, in February last year, I sent an email to him as my local representative and he responded with alacrity and has been constant and unfailing in his devotion and energy that he has thrown at this. He's been burning the midnight, midnight candle all the time and he wrote our Stronger Towns Fund bid and said all of that and got us going on it. So thank you so much, Jeremy, for all that you have done to get us this far. Okay, bless you, Ruth. Thank you very much. Cheerio. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Um, so I would now like to introduce our next speaker, Bill Laws, and I would like to say that this is probably largely his fault because he kept prodding me as a local resident to do something. And I just looked up <laughs> Bill's bio online and it's awesome. Bill is a writer and a social historian. He goes on and on and on. I didn't know he published that many books. Um, so he's going to give us a short presentation on the history and the social history of the Meadows. Over to you, Bill. Cheers, thank you. Hello everybody. How lovely to join you all tonight. Um, yes, there we are. Nice view of the... Thank you, Chloe. What a lovely view. It looks like that now, of course. Slightly deeper, if anything. Um, but if we go straight to the first slide, um, we'll, and we'll have a look at the next slide. That's the one. Here we've got John Speed's map of 1605. Now, um, I do make things up as I go along. So actually what I've had to do is look at the Bartonsham History website to get all my facts, which have been put together by all sorts of people, um, including our last speaker. And um, one of our other members, Andy Tatchell, uh, helped us along with this. This, is, um, this shows why the Bartonsham Meadows was so valuable. You can see them there on the right to the church. Why does the church own this bit of this hundred and whatever it is, uh, acres of land? Um, in fact, before the church, this is probably, uh, it, it's an incredibly important historic landscape. It was part of the patrimony of the earliest church before this predates the cathedral. Um, but just take apart the word Bartonsham. Barton possibly come, comes from, uh, derived from barley farm, corn farm, grange, and um, the ham part, which probably came later, is very much homestead or water meadow. Um, you can see where we're coming from. But the church, the cathedral authorities, um, they did like this bit of land because it was jolly lucrative. It had mills all over the place. You can see a couple there. Um, if we go on to the next slide, thank you, Chloe. Here, here it is, all looking absolutely gorgeous. Um, you've got the Bartonshire Meadows on the right, and um, you've got that great trade that happened, um, the boating trade. Uh, you can see guys uh, pulling, hauling up a um, uh, a boat here, bringing stuff into into Hereford, and later on taking stuff out. So um, we've got two the two great um, earnings that are going on around Barnsham Meadows. That's mills and boats. Um, there are evidence of these two still there. Uh, in fact, as a coracle, uh, like our last speaker, our last speaker and I and a chap called Pete Redding have been down the river and found evidence of two weirs that still are there. The stones are still there in the river, just off Bartonshire Meadows. 
And these were weirs that supported the lucrative mills that were kind of strung out along the river. And um, yes, if we go to the next slide, uh, are we jump one, back one to the tide map? <laughs> well, we could go straight to that one, but it's not one, no, we go, we'll go uh, right backwards, the other way. <laughs> We're going forwards. That's the one. Uh, back to this. There we are. So you're looking at the 1885 tithe map here. It's a bit difficult to count the fields, even to see the names, but you've got there about 10 fields. Uh, you can see very clearly a bit of orcharding. You can probably see the little ponds. There's one, two, and there's a pond on the left by the river. Um, note those ponds, uh, the, the existence of those ponds, really kind of uh, in, important for, from the wildlife point of view. And um, it, what it doesn't give there, or if it does, it's in such small writing, is the names of the meadows. Here we've got um, the meadow, not very original, the great meadow, the lower great meadow, the old hop yard. That's quite interesting. In 1885, we've got the old hop yard. Um, ox pasture. Um, <clears throat> interestingly, lidar has shown um, the, the marks of oxen, uh, ox ploughing marks under, under uh, you know, in the ground. Quite extraordinary. And um, what it doesn't show there, because it's slightly early, is um, the sewage farm. Um, on the right, you can see a little line of withy trees. And that's where the sewage farm, the poo factory, as we affectionately call it, a piece of research by Fran Morgan, um, places that there, and my word, we're grateful for that. Um, whipping on to the next slide, man in aeroplane, you think, what on earth is he doing here? You're looking at Bentfield huts, and we've leapt ahead to 1913. Now, you remember those, uh, and this is obviously the eve of the Great War, and um, in the middle of the Great War, the sanitary engineers of Great Britain met in Hereford and they came to those withy beds to admire um, not only the poo factory, but the fact that the withy beds uh, were being used to uh, provide sallies for making into baskets that were then used to, um, to sell produce in the, in the municipal market. Wonderful bit of sustainable work. And of course, those willows are still there. Um, yeah, poor, poor old Bentfield Hux, he's there offering uh, expensive rides. And um, interesting when you look at the trees behind, they're nice, big, mature trees there. Um, I have to sadly say Bentfield didn't make it to the end of the war, he died. Uh, died of flu, so he didn't actually kill himself in his plane. But very significant time for the meadows, because it was in the middle of the war that the uh, the existing tenant had a terrible heart attack, dropped dead, and the land was given over to a Mr. Matthews. I'm sure many of you have had a, a, a bottle of Bartonshire milk in your time. Um, this was John William Matthews, so he takes over in about 1916, 1917. He's taken over from his granddad Edwin, who um, started off the whole Bartonsham Meadows, uh, Bartonsham Dairy, sorry, uh, with a cow that he called Old Brownie, which he bought for 14 quid bargain. Um, but the business is moved down to Bartonsham, and the church commissioners sign up their, their three generation tenancy. So that's John William. Um, let's whip to the next slide. Um, okay, that's Hampton Park Dairy. That's not Bartonsham Dairy, but you can bet your bottom dollar they went to um, to the Bartonsham Meadows to get their milk. Um, and if we go on to the next slide, um, you can see in, it's a, not a brilliant picture, but you can see in the top left the, 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 the river and you can see those fields. Interesting, if you count them, there are now nine. So we've only lost one out of those ten. Um, and this is probably the vision that um, the middle Mr. Matthews would have had when he was flying in the RAF 
flying his Wellingtons and Lancasters out to war. Actually, this photo was taken by the enemy. This was um, a Luftwaffe photograph taken two years before the, the focus of the photograph, which is the munitions factory, was bombed by them. Um, but the, 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 the significance, um, I've just forgotten the significance of that. Um, yes, Stan, when he comes back, he survives, thank goodness. He comes back and <coughs> he uh, takes over the farm and then his son, John, becomes the final tenant. Um, we've got at this time and in the First World War, we've got the munitions factory that we're looking at. Those munitioners are walking across the, the railway bridge, which had a special bridge put on it, a pedestrian bridge. They're holding their noses up as they go past because where it crosses the river, there's yet another mill. The evidence is still there. That's the bone mill where they ground the bones down um, from the, the dead animals. Very charming. Um, th this time they, they're hand milking 70 to 80 cows. The land army is giving a hand. And um, if it's difficult to see, but one of the ponds has gone, but one pond is still there. So in 1940, one pond is still there. Um, and whipping on to the final slide, all along, this, this um, uh, Anna mentioned that this whole business is sort of cultural history. What you're looking at there, of course, is the municipal swimming pool. This really is the municipal swimming pool. It's paid for by the municipality. Um, there are men and women's changing rooms there. We hope that we might be able to recreate this scene sometime next year. Uh, Covid willing, um, and that's that is indeed where everybody went uh, went for a dip, um, and a lovely big thick hedge there in the background, uh, plenty of wildlife there. We're still looking at the meadows in the days when wildlife was considered a bit of a nuisance, and when a colleague of mine tells me that. In 1936, one Robert Pashley, a rather famous salmon fisher, fisherman, pulled out 400 fish from the Wye. In 2017, the total catch on the whole Wye was 400 fish. So we've seen a bit of a change. Most of those boys would have been out doing a bit of eel fishing. We've seen eel fishing, eel populations fall by 97%. And, well, I think that's probably, uh, that's probably quite enough social history, but it does give one a sense of why it's really important to look after this landscape. Back to you, Ruth. Thank you so much, Bill, for that fascinating and lively race through history. Brilliant. <laughs> um, and the Bartonsham History Group wrote up a history of the meadows, which was contributed to by many of the people on this call, in fact, including Christine. So thank you for that. And there's a link to it on our website and on the Bartonsham History Group. So please do go and check that out. Um, yeah, thanks, Bill. OK, so now we've kind of set out the stall, the history, the ecology. It's over to James Hitchcock um, from Herefordshire Wildlife Trust, who's going to talk a little bit about like what this could be, how this could be managed differently, because I think that's a question that many of you have been asking. So James Hitchcock is a state senior manager at Herefordshire Wildlife Trust. Um, he did a site visit quite early on with his boss, Andrew Nixon, I think, um, and has uh, joined us on some of our discussions with the church commissioners. So thank you for all your effort on this, James, and over to you. Hi, uh, thank you, Ruth, and, and good evening, everybody. A uh, pleasure to join you um, tonight. So if we can have that first slide, Chloe. Um, yeah, and thanks for that um, introduction, Ruth. Um, there's a lot of familiar faces in the crowd um, here tonight, so I won't say a huge amount about the Wildlife Trust and its work, because I know many of you are members, but I did just want to say two things, really. Um, firstly, you know, if you aren't a member, please do consider joining. Um, you know, it's incredibly important for us as a, as a source of income. You know, it's what we call unrestricted income, and it allows us to get involved with community groups like the Friends of Bartonshire Meadows very easily at, at the drop of a hat. You know, if we'd have to apply for grant funding to su support these guys, we'd probably only just be getting going. Um, 
and also really just want to say that's a very exciting time you know for the wildlife trusts and um, there's a lot going on um both politically i suppose and in society at large you know we're experiencing a lot of national policy change and you know the wildlife trusts are working very well together and there's been a lot of change you know within the um ceo and the senior management level including at the the central charity the addition of craig bennett and that's getting us out there there uh, publicly and we really are trying to position ourselves very strongly to advocate and campaign for wildlife and the restoration of wildlife to create a world of herefordshire so yeah i mean wildlife just for those that don't know um are a, a federation of charities uh, with a central charity based at newark they represent us at westminster level and um, work with other environmental non-governmental organizations or eng ngos um, to campaign yeah and, and, and strengthen policy so yeah herefordshire wildlife trust um, owns just over 500 hectares of land and we try to get involved in anything and everything that really conserves and promotes wildlife and promotes and encourages in the engagement um, with, for it and, and within it. So next slide please Craig. Right, so yeah just very quickly on this one I mean really what we're trying to say here is we've got form in this arena you know we, we've got some just over 20 staff who've got a wide range and, and breadth of experience with all sorts of um, engagement and practical land management um, and that includes at very busy and, and very public facing sites um, like Queenswood and Bodham Lake and you know we've we've got a long history of being involved in floodplain meadow sites um, as Anna has pointed out because we've long been involved in Love Meadows and the Sturts um, which is over near Erdersley and botanically the Sturts is by far the better site but obviously Lug has got fantastic social history and is very readily um, accessible to the, the people of Erinfordshire. So next slide please. Okay so we've heard a lot about the value of floodplain meadows and we've heard a lot about the very interesting sort of history of the site. So and Ruth has mentioned that I went out there with uh, my colleague Andrew in probably what was the wettest day of the summer actually just after lockdown one but what I would say is that in no way dampened our spirits. You know, we cycled out there and we got very excited as we walked around. And why did, why did we get excited? Well, firstly, it's a pretty sizable site. Secondly, you know, it's got lots of potential. Um, it, it, it's sort of a really key habitat, I suppose, or, you know, key piece of land for Herefordshire because it's, it would allow, you know, the trust and the friends of Barchester Meadow and the local community to get involved with lots of very topical issues that would do very, very positive things for wildlife and people and their well-being. And, you know, it's that location really, most of all, that got us excited because that's, you know, HR1 postcode, isn't it? You know, a lot of people on the doorstep right next to the two big flagship hotels in the city, lots of stories to tell and, and that's the sort of thing we love. So I won't go back over what Anna covered in terms of the value of floodplain meadows, but what I would say is that that restoration, because until recently they were, you know, largely permanent pasture fields, um, and then, you know, that had been a long-standing land use, they were ploughed up, which is very sad. That would have released a stack of carbon and, and really damaged the uh, water infiltration on the land. And it's just worth saying at this point that, you know, Partial Meadows is still connected as a floodplain. You know, 46% of floodplains are disconnected within um, England. And that is, that's madness. You know, that's, that's, that's cop to stop because that water has to go somewhere. That thunders downstream to someone's house eventually. So, you know, that's already a good start. You know, we, we would look to do some soil tests. You know, you've got to, got to work out what that phosphate level's doing. That's the limit, the biggest limiting factor because phosphate hangs around for a long time. And, you know, we'd have to work out whether the phosphate was at a suitable level to get stuck straight into what we would term green hay strewing or seed broadcasting. And we, um, you know, if, if the phosphate level is high, we might have to actually crop um, the land with an arable crop for a little bit longer, but perhaps without inputs to draw down that phosphate level. Um, when we do um, engage in the broadcasting and the strewing, that's going to take 
probably a good few years because you know you need quite a lot of seed to cover an area of that size and we'd look to perhaps buy in some seed from trusted and reputable sources but we would also look to harvest some through contractors and our own equipment from sites like Sturts and, and Lug. Um, obviously as we build the organic matter, the soil organic matter, that improves the soil filtration and starts to sequester lots of um, or lots more carbon and create more um, carbon stocks. And yeah, I think that's probably all we need to say for now. So next slide please, Chloe. So we've seen from Bill's brilliant talk tonight that there is a history of, of orchards and, and, and orcharding on the site. And, you know, we, we all know, don't we, you know, that's, that's classic Herefordshire. But what we also know is that traditional orchards, and in fact, even commercial orchards with the change in markets, they disappear and they disappear quickly. I mean, orchards fall outside formal protection. You know, you don't need a felon license to, to raise an orchard to the ground. Um, and you know, there are lots of reasons to create orchard from a biodiversity point of view. Um, you know, they support specialist speeches such as Noble Chafer and um, Mistletoe Marbled Minor Moth. Um, and they also, you know, have Blossom, which provides a lot of nectar for our pollinators. But you've got the social aspects, I suppose, and, and, and the historical aspects. You know, we can conserve traditional varieties of Hereford Chapel. That's always a great thing. And obviously, there is a value in engaging the community because we can make a product out of them. And that helps tell stories and stories are where you get the buy-in. You know, we as, a, as an organisation are set up and have experience of making juice and, um, you know, running community orchards. So we'd, we'd really love to, to help with that. Um, so next slide, please. So yeah, obviously wetlands um, are an integral part of floodplain um, sort of management and habitat creation. And we've seen that the wonderful history of the poo factory, which is you know been rather modernised now. But we also know that 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 sewage works; it does flood, doesn't it? And we know that you know that sort of pollution, that phosphate and nitrogen getting into the Y, has played its part in in the water quality falling over the years. So we we'd want to perhaps look at working with Welsh Water to create what we would call an integrated wetland around the site and that would just be effectively like a catch system, a uh, natural rebed filtration system to, to catch that nutrient and protect it. But as we've seen from Bill's talk again, you know, there is a history of um, ponds being present on site. So we'd want to perhaps look at whether we reinstated some of those, perhaps create a few seasonal scrapes because that can help draw in um, you know, passing and migratory um, wetland birds. But I mean, it, again, it's just another s source of, of water. And, you know, with seasonal scrapes, you don't tend to get fish um, staying in there permanently. So it can help um, support a different suite of invertebrates or insect species rather, um, which has, has got great value. Again, you know, wetlands um, help um, sequester lots of carbon, which is another thing we very much want to do. So yeah, next slide, please. Um, hedgerow restoration, again, you know, there, there are hedges on site, but there's loads of scope for improving them, getting them to fill out and managing them so they can fruit on a regular cycle. And, you know, good big bushy hedgerow helps create much more space for nesting birds. You know, at the hedgerow base, you get a good diversity of flora in time, and we could help perhaps expedite that through seeding and um, plug plant introduction. Um, you get to create what we call, you know, micro climates. So effectively, you know, just create warm, sheltered, sunny spots, which are better for um, invertebrates, insects, you know, which, which feed birds in turn. And again, you know, telling stories and also doing meaningful um, work mm -hmm. around the climate and ecological emergency. Yeah, Hedgerows play a big part in storing carbon. And, you know, people get fixated on trees, but you know, we've lost thousands of kilometres of hedgerow over the um, countryside within the last hundred years. You know, and that loss has plateaued a bit. And there have been some gains, but they are paltry com compared to what was here um, 100, 100 odd years ago. So we really do need to address that and push that side of things. Uh, next slide, please. 
so yeah, we could we could go for some direct tree planting on, on parts of the site as well. Again, the government have set the target of planting 30,000 hectares of new woodland a year for the next 10 years. Um, and just as a frame of reference, that's just over double what's being planted now. So that is that is a big task. Now, Herefordshire Wildlife Trust has, has got some reservations on tree planting. You know, it's, it's obviously a brilliant public engagement tool, makes people feel good. It's a positive action. <coughs> You know, when woodland is first planted, you get about 20, 25 years of high levels of carbon drawdown, carbon storage or sequestration, you know, pick your term. But you know, tree guards, plastic often, you know, it's an expensive way of, of doing things. Unless you can get good native local stock, you're potentially bringing in diseases. We could use this as a case study of if you do plant trees, this is what you do, this is what you do well. Or we could actually say, well, look, you know, nature's quite good at um, going through its own cycle and creating woodland eventually. This is what natural succession looks like. And, you know, we could we could demonstrate that both have value. We've looked at to, to work with um, friends of Barton and Meadow to sort of map that out within a management plan. Um, Obviously, trees themselves and wet woodland do have value um, in, in what we call natural flood management. Again, they just help slow the flow, trap nutrients. Trees, you don't want necessarily trees everywhere within floodplains because they, if you're trying to attract um, waders and wetland birds, they are just perch posts for predators and do put things up like curly more. But they do trap a lot of um, nutrients. They are quite hungry com compared to Grassland. Right, so next slide. So public engagement, that's one of their main threats really. You know, there's lots of scope, isn't there, because of the location and you know, it's readily accessible on foot. That's brilliant. That fits well with the, the climate agenda. We would want to take both formal and informal sessions um, with people. We'd want to see assisted and unassisted visits from schools and local groups, you know, scouts, guides, boys brigade. There's lots of scope for doing guided walks. Um, there's a lot of scope actually if we're going to do large scale restoration in um, holding events for land managers and saying, hey, look, you know, if you're interested in the, the new agenda and the public payment for public good in the new agricultural subsidies, come and see what we've done here. This is we consider to be best practice. If we really wanted to go for it, you know, there's potentially messaging around, you know, grass-fed beef and local food production. You know, we're, as I said earlier, we're, we're, we're close to the two big hotels in the city, aren't we? And perhaps, you know, it's something that they'd be interested in supporting. And of course, we do have a growing sort of uh, and reignited tourist forum, don't we? And again, you know, done well, Varsha Meadows should be a big attraction to any visitors coming to the to the city. And we've of course then got the you know the potential for the cycle link through the middle of the site as well. Um, next slide. So yeah, I mean as ever, you know, we would need community support and we'd want community support. You know, there already is community support in fact, but you know we could build on what's already taken place if we were able to get control of the land through volunteer work parties, wardening, you know, and survey and monitoring groups. Um, some of that would be tapping into existing things like um, the UK butterfly um, monitoring scheme where people walk transects from April to September, or it could be um, perhaps single species focused, dictated by the month, and it could be using, you know, platforms like iRecord which are really growing and, you know, um, the trust are looking at using much more widely because it's a great way to, to sort of harvest and, and catalogue data without any of the costs of using the um, the, the county record centre. And of course, yeah, we'd continue to work with all the local residents. So that's uh, hopefully a quick thunder just in time in terms of my 10 minutes on, on how the trust views the land. So yeah, exciting times. We we, we hope we can um, come to a good resolution with the uh, church commissioners. And thanks to everyone 
who's been involved and thanks for all your support. It's very positive and, and very pleasing. Thank you so much, James, not just for your presentation this evening, but for the support that you've put into this project so far, which is about to end because James has spent four and a half years working for Herefordshire Wildlife Trust. Tomorrow is his last day before he takes on Chief Executive of Radnorshire Wildlife Trust. So we thank you so much and we wish you all the best in your new job. And I'm sure, well, I hope that we'll stay in touch. So, but of course, James is going to stay on the line and on the line as it were, because we will have time for questions at the end of this. So you've got the chat function at the bottom of your screen. Please do start putting questions in if you would like to ask questions. I think there tends to be like a flurry at the end of an event to whack all your questions in. But if you want it answered, then get it in now. We might not be able to answer all questions, but we could perhaps try to uh, respond to people after that. So we're almost there. You've just got me to give you a project update and then Chloe's gonna tell you how to get involved and then it's over to, um, over to you for any questions. So yes, me, I'm Ruth Westerby. I've uh, taken on the dubious title of convener of Friends of Bartonshire Meadows because I couldn't possibly take on the chair role because we're not formally constituted yet, as it were. So I'm a local resident, uh, got kids at the local school. In fact, I grew up mostly on Green Street and walked the meadows a lot as a child and moved away for 20 odd years and I'm back in the neighborhood. Um, so yeah. If you could go to the next slide, please, Chloe, because I was trying to sort of express why I think this matters and why I wanted to get involved with this. So the last winter, sort of this time last winter, we'd had some huge floods before Christmas and some huge floods after Christmas. And my kids were looking out the back door and looking at the grass and sort of saying, why is that grass a different colour to that grass? and then just washing, watching all the pesticides wash across and into the river. And I was trying to explain to them what was happening. And, and when you have to explain to a five-year-old, it just, it sort of really shocks you. And my five-year-old was saying, but the bugs will be okay, because what we could do, mummy, is build a little wall around the outside of the meadow so they don't go in. And then they'll be all right, won't they? So I, and so I thought, okay, well, I better maybe write an email or something and, and see. So I think that global patterns of climate change and governance seem completely beyond my personal influence and I frequently feel helpless and absolutely despairing. But if we start local, if we pitch our skills together, if we, pitch so if we pick something that we can influence, together we can work towards positive change for the benefit of all, regionally, locally, globally. Individual activism can make a difference, especially if we start right here where we can influence things. So my invitation to all of you is to join us if you haven't already, um, because this is a collaborative effort um, and we would appreciate everybody's uh, contributions and support in whatever way that is. Next slide, please, Chloe. <laughs> so I'm gonna give you a little project update of what we've done so far and what our plans are, and then invite you to kind of pitch in with us where we should go with our strategy for, for this coming year, perhaps. So we thrashed out our sort of paragraph that describes what we are. Friends of Bartonshire Meadows is a grassroots group supporting environmental and socially beneficial land use practices at Bartonshire Farm Hereford. The group has emerged in response to recent local land management practices, regional flooding and global climate change. The purpose of the group is to support the transition to ecologically and socially beneficial land use practices. The group the group endeavours to engage a conversation between city residents, landowners, land managers, wildlife experts, the church commissioners, the church and other stakeholders. So that was kind of how we set ourselves up in around February last year or when the conversation got started. And we had two main objectives for last year, which was to develop a sufficiently professional organisation to support conversations with the church commissioners who own the land. Secondly, we wanted to build a broad base of support for this initiative in, in itself and to help make our voice louder and heard more clearly. So we thank everybody who has supported us so far. Next slide, slide please, Chloe. So what progress have we had in achieving these objectives? Um, the land is uh, a tenanted dairy farm. It's been uh, tenanted as a dairy farm for three generations by the Matthews family um, and the land is owned by the church commissioners um, and in the last year or so it was sublet um, to the arable farmer um, Chris Whitty, sorry not Chris Whitty, I've got Chris Whitty in my head because we've been saying next slide please. Um, so 
Um, th that transition of land use was particularly devastating when it was combined with the, the flooding and the nature of this piece of land. So that's what kind of got things going. So we have successfully engaged with the church commissioners in terms of initiating a conversation, having regular meetings and having positive regular meetings. So for example, we spoke on the 7th of September, the 16th of December and today. So we had a meeting with the church commissioners this afternoon. Next slide, please. Thank you. So what have we done in this year? We've set up a working group, um, so which is some of us who are speaking now, but also other people who are here tonight were in the working group. So Mo Burns has been extremely helpful. Charlie Arthur's here. If in your questions you have anything you'd like to ask them, please do pop that in and, and bring them into the conversation. We've, uh, we've built a wonderful website. We've set up our mission statement. We've developed frequently asked questions, which are available on our site to try and explain a bit more about what we're trying to achieve. Um, we've um, been very helped by some supporting organisations and I think we've got quite a broad base of support there. So the Herefordshire Wildlife Trust came on board very early on to advise us and also then indicated that they would be willing to manage this land if such an opportunity came available, if we could create such an opportunity. The Community Association, I have asterisks because I need to thank them particularly for allowing us to use their bank account. We are not formally constituted as a charity, we don't have our own bank account but they hold funds for us which enables us to do stuff. Bartonshire History Group, Bill wrote us a fantastic history or wrote a history that we have found very useful. St Paul and St James Churches have been very supportive. Hereford Yoga Centre, uh, a rule of thumb, so that's your um, local restaurants uh, who, who take um, beef grass-fed beef cattle straight to the table. Growing Local, Healing Herbs, Butch Flower Remedies have been really generous in their donations to us. Yeah, I've said Partnership History Group has written a great history of the meadows. Um, if people sign up through our, our website, we can count them as supporters and email them regularly. So we've got over 100 now. We've had heaps of volunteers and off offers of volunteering. And, um, and we've got a Facebook and Instagram account. We have delivered over 2000 newsletters locally. We've organised a meadows walk in September. We did a clean up of the road ditch. Um, we had to postpone a species mapping walk that we had planned for December, but hopefully we'll um, reconvene that as soon as possible. We've raised over £2,500 through um, the generos generosity of um, supporters like you guys. Um, we've been in touch with Hereford Council through uh, Jeremy Mill. We've lobbied the local MP, Jesse Norman, and we had an online meeting with him in November. He was super supportive. It fit in with many of his priorities for Hereford, which is to address flooding, uh, to level up um, and uh, the environment. And he was also generous in his donations to us. We applied twice to the Stronger Towns Fund, so we failed. Um, our first bid didn't get through and um, Andrew Nixon put a lot of work into that and we resubmitted, but unfortunately we didn't get through again. Of course it was a speculative bid because we don't have land management um, rights, but it was an important project that we needed to do. Next slide please, Chloe. Um, um, in terms of our communications, we developed a communication strategy document after we had appointed Chloe Bradman as our communications coordinator, and she's just gonna say a few words after me. Um, and that's because Hereford Yoga Centre was generous enough to donate um, quite a lot of Chloe's time. And then we were able to appoint her based on the funds that we had managed to raise. We've engaged with various state Holders, including the Wyan Ask, Will Hope Natur Naturalist Field Club, Hereford and District Angling Association, Wyan Salmon Association, Campaign for the Protection of Rural England, Growing Local. We've written monthly newsletters. Um, Chloe's been in charge of posting regularly on Facebook and Instagram. Um, the Herefordshire Wildlife Trust um, hosted a blog, an introductory blog about us on their website before Christmas, which was fantastic and sort of set up for this event. Um, and some of us, so Anna, Charlie and myself were interviewed by Nicola Goodwin of BBC Hereford in Worcester just before Christmas and that aired uh, Monday just gone, Monday of this week I think and um, we can share that with you. Uh, so next slide please Chloe. And, I, and there was a, it was a very pos positively received broadcast I think there was a lot of positive comments made on the BBC Hereford and Worcester site, Facebook site which then push people through to signing up to support us. So what are we going to do in 2021? We've sort of started a, a consultation strategy um, and we'd like to hear as many comments about what you think we should do and how you might be able to help us achieve those things um, from you. So you can 
do that now in the chat or you can be emailing us, that would be really helpful. So we want to continue to engage with key stakeholders, including the church commissioners, alongside Herefordshire Wildlife Trust. We're currently consulting with the working group and expert advisors to develop a strategy for this year, including species mapping, environmental management plan, campaign strategy and fundraising. We want to produce detailed resources on biodiversity and land management to support our communication strategy. We would really need to develop our organisational structure and our democratic accountability uh, including constitution officers, bank accounts, etc. We haven't done that so far because we don't know what we're doing in terms of the church commissioners. We don't know whether we're a, a lobbying group lobbying a, a different land uh, manager to improve their environmental practices or whether we might be involved in the land management itself. We also want to support volunteering opportunities and we've been in touch with the Herefordshire Voluntary Services Support Officers and they've indicated they can help us with a lot of resources. So volunteering opportunities might include species mapping, arts, Himalayan balsam bashing and things like that. Next slide please, Chloe. Oh, that's that's Chloe's slide. <laughs> so I suppose I should conclude what I was going to say by, yeah, we met the church commissioners um, today. I, I'm still sort of not completely at liberty to to say where we're at with those conversations. Generally, it was positive, And I think by next week, we should be able to maybe pop out a newsletter. Um, I think that we are quite close to being in a position to pitch and to manage or to buy the land. I really shouldn't say more necessarily, but we will fill you in as soon as we possibly can. Um, yeah, thanks ever so much. And Chloe, over to you. Great, thanks Ruth. I'm just going to pop up this last slide in all its glory. Um, so really quick from me, how you can get involved. Um, so as Ruth said about uh, a newsletter coming out next week, we put newsletters out monthly um, and you can get that via our mailing list. While you're doing your questions, I'll pop links in the chat as well. So if you see anything from me, just open up the link and then that'll take you straight to the website where you can sign up to that. Um, we'd love to hear your feedback uh, outside of this event, um, beyond your questions and anything like that. Uh, your pictures of the meadows on your walks, like we'd love to keep getting updates on what it's looking like. We've had some amazing photography contributions so far for the social media um, at the minute, so that's great. And uh, follow us if you are on social media. So we're on Instagram and at Friends of Bartisan Meadows. And we've got a Facebook group, which you can join, obviously under the same name. Um, and we've got our email address there. If you have any suggestions, comments, um, yeah, we'd love to hear from you. We're always op uh, open to volunteering opportunities. And that's one thing that we're gonna try and push um, this year is to capitalize on that. So. Yeah, that's all from me. I guess it's over to questions now, but thank you, everyone. Um, so, Anne, I'm not sure how you want to run the Q&A. Do you want to sort of share it? Um, while I'm seeing if you're there, maybe maybe Bill could take that first question. Well, so there's a question about the, where the basin was on the map. But um, Chloe will have to find the slides again for that. Um... I think I can I can just respond to the where is the bassam. I, I have him I have chatted him back. I've sent a message back to him. But if you go to the Bartonsham History website, there are a few maps there that Christine Earl, our web mistress, has put up which are really superb. They, they, they show fairly clearly where it is. Um, there's a hedge that, that heads towards the river. And uh, that bit of the hedge is, is kind of not there anymore, but you can see from the map exactly where it is. Great, thanks ever so much, Bill. So Jim Hardy, hi Jim, you're asking um, whether John Matthews is willing to give up the lease. Um, I'm not really, liberty to I, I haven't been told that as a as a fact I have been told that we can meet again at the end of next week um, so I'm hoping to 
have a super positive email to send out next week. It's been a long year of hoping to have meetings and super positive things to say. Um, I, yeah, I think it's not it's not done. Um, uh, we've still got a lot of work ahead of us. If 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 we are to see these meadows managed in the way that we have been describing this evening, with the benefits that might accrue, so still a way to go. Okay, and is and Adrian. It, is, is it sympathetic though? It's, I mean, I just I just don't see where you're how you're going planning to get from where you are now to where you want to be. Please, do you want me to come in? Please, this and so on. Yeah, thank you very much, Jim. Right. Over to James Hitchcock. Yeah, yeah, Jim. I think um, you know we've we've obviously um, wanted to highlight you know what could be done on the site. I think one of the elements that we did, perhaps purposefully not mention, was that when the um, fields were sublet, they were ploughed. But crucially, they were ploughed without permission. You know, there was no environmental impacts carried out, as far as we know. And, you know, we, we sort of, you know, know that there are various things at play, both within family review points of the lease and the general thoughts and feelings of the church commissioners that have given us enough hope to feel we perhaps could further discussions and come to some sort of positive arrangement that secures a better future for those meadows, for wildlife and the community. But, you know, that's probably all we can say at this moment, because it is very sensitive, um, not least because, you know, people's livelihoods and, you know, family histories are at stake. And also because, you know, the church commissioners have obviously got a fiduciary duty to, to, to sort of, uh, yeah, get as much revenue from any piece of land they own. Uh, as possible and you know we, I mean you're right to, I saw one of your other questions we haven't mentioned farmers um, we obviously would look to engage with farmers in the sense that we would want to demonstrate best practice but of course you know we you know yourself that the scale of the work we're describing is going to be above and beyond what trust staff and trust volunteers and local residents can do you know we're going to need to engage contractors so we're going to bring in the farming community that way and we're going to need you know in the long term to to get a grazier and you know that that's that's going to be a perfect role for a local farmer you know, we haven't necessarily identified anyone yet we're sort of focused on you know what would that overall management look like how would it fit together and how might that stack up? And what does that mean for any options that are put forward on the table in terms of purchase versus lease from the, the church commissioners? So that's sort of the mechanics of the discussion that Andrew and I and, and Ruth and, and others have all been part of. So you know, I hope that answers the question and I hope that was clear to everything. Thanks very much, James. Yeah, and in terms of those negotiations, my priority would be to buy the land if it's all possible. Um, and if not buy, then it would have to be the longest possible lease that we could get agreed. And um, the Herefordshire Wildlife Trust usually don't work on less than 25 to 30 year leases. Um, that, that I think that will be one of the sticking points going forward. And we will be doing our best to make as strong a case as possible um, by outlining the sort of vision that we have shared with everyone this evening. Do we have any other questions? Uh, Bill sticking his hand up. I, w I also wanted to call on Mo and Charlie, who've been really closely involved with the project, that if they have anything to contribute that they don't think we've covered, then please do um, talk. Bill, did you want to go? Yeah. Uh, just, just a very quick thing that, that this, there's nothing new in the church commissioners handing land in a sense over to the community and that that's what they did with the Bishop's Meadow in, in 1916. Great, and thank you for Annie Finch's comment. Yes, I saw that uh, coverage of the, the water, uh, swimming water quality. And Adrian, thank you for your comment that you, you got the newsletter and it, it worked in encouraging you to join up. Um, Charlie, did you want to pitch in with anything? Hi, um, yeah, um, just to say briefly that um, archaeologically it's a really rich landscape as well, full of, full of um, earthworks that we really don't understand at this stage. And lots of uh, conflicting theories, so sort of 
archaeologically it's quite exciting um and um yeah there's lots to do there sort of community engagement wise as well you know you can really <clears throat> start to you know get on board and connect with the um friends of uh, castle green as well they're kind of launching a similar project hoping to get community involved so and really as bill said that the, the barbershop meadows are sort of should be viewed as part of a kind of a broader kind of landscape of Hereford City, you know, conjoined to the Castle Green and sort of thought of, thought as as a kind of a, you know, as a Saxon uh, farm initially, um, and then going forward to be, being part of the sort of medieval landscape and, and then on into the sort of post-medieval orchards and ponds and, yeah, a really fascinating landscape. There's lumps and bumps and ditches and banks all over there. And we really, we really don't have a, a clue at the moment um, whether there really was ridge and furrow there, whether there were these meadow, um, water meadows that some people have hypothesized. We, we have no idea. Um, we know that there was some, you know, civil war use of the, um, thanks to Ian's amazing community um, um, archaeology project. We have an idea now that, they, they, that we can say that those civil war defences probably were, you know, they probably were used, the road ditch probably was used as a civil war defence, but um, it, it's likely that its origins is a, is a paleo channel that it, something to do with the, the end of the, the Ice Age and the early Holocene sort of feature. And, and those are all over the meadows as well, these kind of paleo channels, these ancient river channels. So it's really difficult um, landscape to untangle archaeologically. And um, when you look at the, the air photos and the, the LIDAR scans, it's, it's really complex. But, but if it was to be um, sort of a community managed um, nature reserve, then from a heritage and archaeology point of view, there's a lot of potential as well. And obviously that links directly into how we might sort of put together a management plan in terms of wetlands and things like that, but actually trying to um, figure out what are the ancient features and maybe how we can restore some of some of these um, wetlands that we think are, are probably do go back to sort of the early Holocene, um, you know, and things like that. So yeah, there's a lot of potential for linking in with them, um, you know, between the archaeology and the uh, ecological aspects of that, of that land as well. So there we go. Thank you so much, Charlie. Charlie's also a local resident and an archaeologist. Mo, Mo Burns has been an early supporter and very, very much involved. She's a local tree warden and she's a, a joint director of the Herefordshire Wildlife Trust City branch, I think. Would you like to add anything? Well, committee member, I think, Ruth. I think you promoted me beyond my abilities there. Um, yeah, I, I was just thinking earlier when um, uh, Jeremy was mentioning the, the Stronger Towns bid and, and I was thinking, well, it'd be wonderful if, you know, if, if all that we, we aspire and, um, you know, um, want for this, <laughs> this project comes to pass, then the Stronger Towns bid can rue the day that they, <laughs> that they didn't support what will in, f in, in effect be uh, the most extraordinary um, greening of the city beyond, you know, their wildest dreams. Uh, if, if all the elements that that would be mentioned tonight, you know, are uh, are included, so yeah, uh, well, rock on, really, and uh, let's hope that the uh, church commissioners uh, respond in the way that we aspire them to. But uh, we, that's that's next week's <laughs> story. So yeah. And thank you uh, for all, all that you've done, Ruth, to pull this together. It's extraordinary, your, your commitment. Thanks, Mo. Thanks, everybody who has spoken tonight and all of your questions. And I'm going to hand over to Anne um, and to very much thank Heritage of Wildlife Trust City event for City, um, whatever. Okay. <laughs> well, what can I say? I mean, thank you. That was a brilliant presentation and what a dynamic group the Friends of Barton Gemetto are.